on the morality of thinking. Naivety and sophistication are concepts so endlessly intertwined that no good can come of playing one off against one off against the other. The defense of the ingen- ingenuous, as practiced by irrationalists and intellectual beaters of all kinds, is a noble reflection that takes sides with naivety condemns itself. Cunning and obscurantism remain what they always were, immediately, immediately to affirm immediacy instead of comprehending it as mediated within itself, is to pervert thought into an apologia of its antithesis, into the immediate lie. This perversion serves all bad purposes, from the private pig-headedness of lives like that to the justification of social injustice as a law of nature. However, to wish on these grounds to erect the opposite as a principle and to call philosophy, as I once did myself, the binding obligation to be sophisticated is hardly better. It is not only that sophistication, in the sense of worldly, wise, hard-boiled shrewdness, is a dubious medium of knowledge, forever liable, through its affinity to the practical orders of life and its general mental distrust of theory, itself to revert to a naivety engrossed with utilitarian goals. Even when sophistication is understood in the theoretically acceptable sense of that which widens horizons, passes beyond the isolated phenomenon, considers the whole, there is still a cloud in the sky. It is just this passing on and being unable to linger, this tacked ascent to the primacy of the general over the particular, which constitutes not only the deception of idealism and hypostasizing concepts, but also its inhumanity that has no sooner grasped the particular than it reduces it to a thorough thorough station or to a through station and finally comes all too quickly to terms with suffering and death for the sake of a reconciliation occurring merely in reflection. In the last analysis, the bourgeois coldness that is only too willing to underwrite the inevitable. Knowledge can only widen horizons by abiding so insistently with particular that its isolation is dispelled. This admittedly presupposes a relation to the general, though not one of subsumption, but rather almost the reverse. Dialectical mediation is not a recourse to the more abstract, but a process of resolution of the concrete in itself. Nietzsche, who too often thought in over-wide horizons himself, was nevertheless aware of this. He who seeks to mediate between two bold thinkers, he writes in The Gay Science, stamps himself as mediocre. He has not the eyes to see uniqueness, to perceive resemblances everywhere, making everything alike as a sign of weak eyesight. The morality of thought lies in a procedure that is neither entrenched nor detached, neither blind nor empty, neither atomistic nor consequential. The double-edged method which has earned Hegel's phenomenology the reputation among reasonable people of unfathomable difficulty, that is, its simultaneous demands that phenomena be allowed to speak as such and appear looking on, and yet that their relation to consciousness as the subject reflection be at every moment maintained, expresses this morality most directly and in all its depth of contradiction. But how much more difficult has it become to conform to such morality now that it is no longer possible to convince oneself of the identity of subject and object, the ultimate assumption of which still enabled Hegel to conceal the antagonistic demands of observation and interpretation? Nothing less is asked of the thinker today, than that he should be at every moment both within things and outside them. Munchausen, pulling himself out of the bog by his pigtail, becomes the pattern of knowledge which wishes to be more than either verification or speculation. And then the salaried philosophers come along and reproach us with having no definite point of view.